My name is David Vogel, and I'm an investment manager. Um, I use uh, data-driven models uh, to make investment decisions. Um, but throughout my career, uh, really, most importantly, I'm a data scientist. I've applied data science to many industries. And what data science is, is using historical information uh, to predict future outcomes. Data science can be applied across many industries. I've found that a more accurate prediction can be made using historical data than from using a fuzzy formula based on a theory or the latest industry opinion. Bottom line is, data doesn't lie, and when there's a pattern, those patterns often repeat. Uh, well, I mainly wanted to give the perspective from not only <clears throat> an investor, uh, but also um, a predictive modeler, um, someone who my background is in <clears throat> analyzing data, first and foremost. So that's <clears throat> basically what I apply when, when applying investments <clears throat> when employing investment strategies, and it's also what I've applied uh, through my entire career in terms of coming up with results. As you can see from my competition record, I've used historical data and data analysis to determine everything from marketing decisions right through to making credit scoring decisions. Using data to predict is a powerful tool. Using historical data has been a common denominator throughout my entire career. In 2004, I won the KDD Cup using historical data to differentiate matter from antimatter. And more recently, in 2013, I led the winning team using the same technique to predict health outcomes for the Heritage Health Prize. This was an extremely competitive event with several thousand teams competing for the half a million dollar prize. Here are some examples of thinking about climate change from the perspective of an investor. Throughout this presentation, I'll be demonstrating how data connects human behavior to climate change and global warming and what that means economically. I'm based in Florida, so naturally I'm concerned about hurricanes and have analyzed hurricane data. I'm about to show you just how solid the connection is between carbon emissions and the increase in hurricane damages we have been seeing in recent years. One of the common claims about climate science is that it's new and unproven. That is completely untrue. This science is 200 years old. This science goes right back to when we wondered why the Earth and the moon, both the same distance from the sun, were a different temperature. The earth at 59 degrees and the moon minus three, and were both the same distance from the sun? The main difference is greenhouse gases and hence having greenhouse gases is good. The primary reason being carbon dioxide in the amount that is natural, about two trillion tons, keeps us from freezing to death. But fossil fuel emissions have increased the amount from two trillion tons to three trillion tons, a 50% increase. And this increase is going to cause an unprecedented level of warming, which will be very dangerous for the entire population. These concerns are not new. Scientists have been studying global warming since shortly after we started producing fossil fuel emissions. As far back as 1895, scientists were already projecting the amount of warming, which comes out pretty darn close to the projections I've done today. Quite similar, to the projection of climate scientists today, the physicists 120 years ago predicted that doubling the Earth's carbon dioxide would increase the Earth's temperature by five or six degrees Celsius. And guess what? We are about halfway there. In this presentation, I'll be citing basic physics and chemistry, and I will not be using numbers from environmentalist data sources, since there may be skeptics watching. These are all my own numbers to illustrate my own points. So let's get into the math. We'll be talking about concentrations of carbon dioxide, and we have to first distinguish exactly how much of that is human-made. Let's first establish how much air there is. How many molecules of atmosphere are there? Um, and it seems like it would be uh, this big grand calculation, uh, but really it's as simple as, as taking a barometer, uh, which can weigh the air, and knowing that there are 2.2 pounds of pressure over every square centimeter of Earth. We know that the radius of the Earth is 637 million centimeters, so we simply use a high school geometry formula for surface area to calculate how many kilograms of air there are. We multiply it out to get one followed by 44 zeros molecules of air. One part per million corresponds to one followed by 38 zeros. So whenever you see that amount of molecules, that equates to one part per million in terms of concentration. 
This graph here shows the increase in parts per million over the past six years. You can see that within a given year there are seasonal fluctuations in the carbon dioxide concentration, but what is increasing every year is the overall concentration. When you see an increase of about three parts per million every single year, the question becomes, is this man-made or natural? We can do calculations to discern that. Starting with the coal industry, and I told you I wouldn't use environmentalist numbers, these are numbers published by oil and gas companies. Currently, every year we burn 5.5 billion tons of coal by weight, and of course, when that is burned, it ends up in the atmosphere. We can then multiply that out to a number of molecules, two followed by 38 zeros, and this equates to two parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere just from coal every year. Moving on to the oil industry, and again I'm using published numbers that are openly available to oil traders who need to know accurate consumption numbers. These are carefully evaluated quantities. The global consumption of oil is 96 million barrels per day, which equates to about 35 billion barrels per year. So now we know how many barrels are consumed. We also know that a barrel of oil weighs about 275 pounds. And we understand the contents of that barrel to be 80% carbon by weight. So knowing how much carbon is in there, and with a very basic understanding of the refinery process, we can give a conservative estimate that at least 86 kilograms of carbon dioxide are released into the atmosphere per barrel consumed. By multiplying that out by the 35 billion barrels, you get almost one and a half parts per million concentration of carbon dioxide just from the oil industry alone in any given year. So we can see that there is no debate that the increase of 3.3 parts per million each year is man-made. We have just accounted for all the new molecules of carbon dioxide with numbers widely published by the energy industry. This increase is 100% man-made from carbon dioxide unless you want to debate fundamental math. The next graph illustrates exactly how unnatural this pattern is. This is a graph showing the concentration of carbon dioxide of the earth over the last million years. While there are a few naturally occurring ups and downs, typically to move up and down 50 parts per million takes thousands of years, yet the current spike in the span of 100 years shows a climb to unprecedented levels at an unprecedented speed. So how do we know what the carbon dioxide, temp carbon dioxide concentration was 800,000 years ago? I've had the privilege of interviewing um, some of the world's top glaciologists, and glaciology is an entire science and devoted uh, to this. And it was explained to me how you can drill down into the ice core, um, get samples. From that sample, you can actually figure out, based on the half-life of certain compounds in that sample, how old, how old the sample is. You know what year it was from. You can measure from the little pockets of air uh, what the carbon dioxide concentration was. So this graph here is produced by piecing those data points together. And also very important for the next graphs is that we can also establish from that ice sample, based on the density of the water, we know what the average temperature was of the region. This is crucial. It's well known in the scientific community that the water density in Florida, for instance, is different from the water density at the North Pole. It is proportional to the average temperature in that region. The graph you see was produced from piecing those data points together. The graph is an illustration of data points from ice samples showing what the carbon dioxide concentration was at a given point in time alongside Earth's temperature. The x-axis shows the carbon dioxide concentration and the y-axis shows the relative Earth's temperature. You can see an incredible 91% correlation, which is about as strong a correlation as we ever see in data modeling. So carbon dioxide doesn't account for 100% of warming, but it's pretty darn close and incredibly predictive. Using this information, we can project out our current carbon dioxide concentration to figure out how much warming we should expect to see from say 50 to 100 years from now. We already know that in the past 50 to 100 years we have seen two degrees Fahrenheit of warming. The graph projects that we will see a total of six degrees of warming from the current concentration. We are talking about another four degrees. 
One thing I want to clarify is that these projections are based on temperatures at the Antarctic, and that's 6 degrees Celsius. Generally, the Arctic has about double the rate of warming compared to the average of the rest of the planet. Therefore, the overall average we would project to be about 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Meteorologists have known for decades that the most predictive factor of a tropical cyclone size and strength is the water temperature it passes through. This slide here illustrates how much impact just a few degrees can have on hurricanes. What we define as hurricane season is the time during which the water is warmest. This season is considered to be June through November when the water has the potential to be 80 degrees or higher. 80 degrees appears to be the threshold whereby a hurricane can thrive. When you see hurricane projections on weather reports on TV or online, the weakening and strengthening is mainly based on the temperature of the water. The warm water strengthens them, and the cool water weakens them. Just a few degrees makes a huge difference. In 2017, we saw warmer waters, which led to a more active hurricane season than we have ever seen before. The most difficult question to answer scientifically is how fast we will accelerate to six degrees of warming. We know that there has been two degrees of warming in the last 50 to 100 years, and we can look at the historical graph and see that the rate of warming is speeding up. The shape of the graph shows that we could see up to one degree of warming per decade, but hopefully it will not be more than one degree Fahrenheit per two decades. Based on the science of global warming and the current concentration, I do not expect this graph to flatten out. In fact, the prediction is that it will continue to accelerate upward. I decided to do my own analysis on how water temperature affects the frequency of hurricanes. This graph shows data I personally downloaded from buoys in the path of most hurricanes that end up hitting the United States. We can see that water temperature on the x-axis corresponds pretty linearly to the y-axis, which is the frequency of hurricanes. The leftmost data points are the beginning and ending of hurricane season where the water is barely warm enough to warrant an occasional hurricane. On the right you see September. September is typically where we see the hottest water temperatures and the most hurricanes. To be specific, 84 degree water equals lots of hurricanes. From this graph you can clearly see that with six degrees of warming we could expect to see increasing numbers and frequency of hurricanes. What is not shown but can be correlated is the increasing intensity of those hurricanes passing through warmer water. If you examine the storm statistics, you can see that typically 81 to 82 degree water is associated with category one and two hurricanes, while 84 degree water is associated with categories four and five, which are obviously much more intense and damaging hurricanes. So let's roll up the calculations from those slides and project the total amount of damages over the next 50 years. We can project that the several hundred billion dollar price tag from this hurricane season is going to become a more frequent and normal thing. Rolling up the projections, we can see the total damages over the next 50 years being approximately 15 trillion dollars just from hurricanes and their effects from global warming. If you think the projection is exaggerated, I put a graph in the upper left corner from the last few decades for perspective. You can see that the cost from hurricanes doubles every decade and sometimes even triples. I am showing inflation adjusted dollars in these graphs. Hurricanes are just one of the many effects on our economy from global warming. The availability of water is becoming increasingly expensive, especially in the western United States. The negative effects of warming on health has shown healthcare costs to be $240 billion per year according to a recent study. The forest fires, which we have been seeing in California recently is another side effect costing billions each year. Naturally, warmer and drier weather will increase the frequency and intensity of those fires. One of the side effects of global warming is the melting of the glaciers and the ice in the Arctic, and we see a steady rise in water level every year, and this graph shows where the water is rising most rapidly, causing cities to spend billions of dollars to deal with the consequences of high water levels. So, the big question is what will happen once we connect carbon emissions to the damages being done. We have seen a historical precedent whereby companies have been held ultimately accountable. Hundreds of billions from lawsuits and settlements were paid by the tobacco industry to people damaged by their products.
the asbestos industry has paid out hundreds of billions to those affected by their products. Even BP was held accountable for the disaster in the Gulf and the damages done there. Today, we are starting to see lawsuits emerge in several states suing companies for climate damages due to fossil fuels. This raises the question of will this become the solution or will there be other ways people will be held accountable for the emissions? So, if there really is a $50 trillion price tag, and whether the exact figure is $40 trillion or $60 trillion, the figure is an order of magnitude more than the entire market cap of the oil and gas industry. The market cap of the entire industry is only about $5.5 trillion. The scale of the liability would mean that it would be impossible for lawsuits to pay for the amount of damages being done. This is why there must be alternative actions in place. And the reason why these alternative actions can be justified is, is unlike the tobacco industry, which can be shut off when, if we want to, or the um, asbestos, there are alternatives. Uh, we can't just shut off fossil fuels right away. We have to move steadily away from it. Uh, but in the meantime, there are damages being done. And, and that $50 trillion price tag, when divided amongst approximately trillion tons of carbon uh, being, um, having been dumped in the atmosphere by humans, comes out to about $50 per ton. This, in turn, equates to approximately 50 cents per gallon of gas. It can also be equated to energy used in your home. If the energy in your home is being fed by oil or coal, the cost is $0.05 cents per kilowatt hour and $0.03 cents if you're using natural gas. Renewable and nuclear energy have zero carbon cost. We have to get this into the economics so that if people are paying for the damages, they can still use the fossil fuels um, if they need to, but this will steer the economics in the direction of the less damaging forms of energy.